Welcome to Akalov, a new podcast, video cast from ACGA. I'm Bill Cassidy, Liam Okasata, and uh, I'm here today with Dr. Michael Newton. This is the first of a new series of, of video podcasts that we're producing at ACGA. And we're going to give you uh, each time, each program, an interview with someone who's doing something of great interest to us in the Gaelic world, uh, the Scottish Gaelic world, perhaps also going beyond the Scottish Gaelic world. We'll give you a bit of uh, conversation in Gaelic and also a lot of conversation in English. So don't be concerned if you're not a fluent speaker. Much of this series, much of today's program is going to be in English with a flavor of Gaelic for you. Well, we will come to you. Catch of the Fulak and Rasta. I mean, Fulak and the Carolina Tour, and in Bala, Russian Canat, well, Russian Can Shingya, Krach Nakilia, no Chapel Hill on the Vera one. Mm hmm. Akas Jahawa Jahashiv at Jilavanshin. Well, Emmet Ach Root, I may go per launch you on a computer ach, ach, on the Hauman and a hackam, on the Hood and a hackam go hain, I may go per it round to hug the garrick and an Emmetach Brun or could be a Gimmetach Cusper. Well, Hashim Tolichia, Converge of Colorine and Jew, modern tank. A Mavion. So I want to introduce Dr. Michael Newton. Uh, Michael earned a PhD in Celtic studies from the University of Edinburgh in 1998 and was an assistant professor in the Celtic studies department of St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia from 2008 to 2013. He's written numerous books about Scottish Gaelic culture and history and is a leading authority on Scottish Gaelic heritage in North America. And I think one of the early books that I remember of yours was uh, were Indians short And you can correct me if I'm wrong there. But uh, in 2020, Michael received uh, you know, a special award, the best Gaelic nonfiction book of the year by the Gaelic Books Council in Scotland for Anul Asarjit, the highest apple a uh, comprehensive anthology of Scottish Gaelic literature co-edited with Wilson MacLeod. His latest book is Gaelic in Your Gob. And with that intriguing title, it's an exploration of English words that originate in Scottish Gaelic. So Michael, thank you again for joining us. That is a really intriguing title. Can you tell us a bit more about the idea behind this book and how it came to be? Right, well, the way that it came to be is simply really from the beginning of my uh, exploration of Scottish Gaelic when I started learning in the 19, early 1990s um, and throughout that time period to the present, of course, not only I have been curious about the origins of English words that look similar to Gaelic ones, but I see that that's a very, very common question amongst people. And now there are some over half of a million people, which is amazing, half a million people who are, who are or, or who have started learning Gaelic through Duolingo. And, you know, I'm on a number of Facebook groups and I see people have these discussions about words that they're learning that are familiar, familiar uh, in terms of words that they know already in English. And the question arises all the time, you know, is this a Gaelic word originally or is this an English word that's brought into Gaelic? So um, I, I, I started the book just over a year ago before this pandemic really you know, took a hold on our lives. And I just decided this would be a really good um, bridge or segue for a lot of people to get some insights into the Gallic language and the history of interaction with English. And that can provide, I think, some insights and some bridges across the language groups. So that's kind of how I started it. And it has been something that sort of helped keep me sane to a, to a degree during the pandemic because there are 48 different words. And so each of them is a little essay and I could just like focus on that essay for the week and try not to let the other things of the world distract me. <laughs> so we have a great burgeoning 
interest in Scottish Gaelic right now, not just in Scotland, where they are investing money into new programs to teach the language to adults, but also in North America. Uh, when you look at these words, I mean, there's, there seems to be a great interest in words in general today. Uh, 2017, we saw Robert McFarland's book, The Lost Words, come out, and that was an international su success and sensation. Uh, a little bit later, I think 2018, we saw The History of Ireland in 100 Words, which was a really fascinating book looking at 100 words in Irish that have some relation to Irish history, Irish society, and culture. Uh, what do you think accounts in general for this uh, much greater interest, this great interest in words today. And how do you relate that back to this growing interest in Gaelic? Well, um, I think that there's been a, a great deal of attention paid to the idea of the vulnerability of languages and endangered languages, especially over the last 10 years. And so I think that's maybe made people a little bit more conscious about aspects of in, intangible cultural heritage. And that, that term itself has been kind of promoted and, and put into the public spotlight by groups like UNESCO. So, you know, this may be part of what's going on. I, I, I don't know for sure, but that's just a guess. <laughs> um, but certainly there's been a number of books lately on this question of language and words and their relationship to culture and how quickly things have changed and have been changing. And you know what we lose when we lose a culture or even when we just lose words that are in a vocabulary, which is what Robert McFarland's book is about, that you know, our relationship to the natural environment is reflected in the words that we use or don't use. And there are all these words that have gone out of usage simply because our connection to the environment has to be expressed in some way. And when we lose that, we lose the words. Right, and that's within just within any language, especially in this era we're in today, where our, our environment, our landscape is changing so rapidly that the way we describe the environment, the way we relate to it can change rapidly. Uh, you know, I was really interested in some uh, comments you made early in the book about the relationships between languages. And I think this is a fascinating part of your work this, in, this, in this volume. We have several language communities within the British Isles, mm -hmm. from the Goidelic or Gaelic, Britonic, you know, English, Germanic, you could say, because it's different dialects of English at different times. Uh, words go, I think you say, ricocheting back and forth between these languages. Uh, what does this tell us about, you know, when you look at these words that you've examined, what do they tell us about the relationship between the languages themselves and the people, of course, who speak them and how those relationships have changed? Well, I think it tells us a, a great many things and some of them are kind of counterintuitive because people tend to be sort of swimming or floating in the moment and their view of things is based on what they look like in that moment. And it takes, I think, a lot of training for most people in exposure to the humanities to realize that everything changes. Languages change, cultures change. And when you want to, fit, when you want to see that, uh, what you have to do is look at snapshots through time, through things like documents, texts that are written down that kind of preserve the state and the usage of words and language and culture at a particular time. And when you do that, you realize that nothing is stable, nothing is solid, and that the meaning of words change and the words we use change over time, just as does culture, just as does identity. So, um, you know, another thing that's kind of counterintuitive and kind of odd is that the, even the words that people use for themselves and for their identities change. So the very first word that I look at in the book is the word Scott which is of course the word that we use nowadays for somebody who is from the kingdom of Scotland. Uh, but that word in itself reveals how com complex this is because originally the term Scot, well, we, we, our first records of it are from Latin, but it does not seem to be a Latin name or word itself. 
it seems to have been borrowed from Gallic referring to, referring to the elite, to the cream of the crop, crop. So it means basically flower, flower of Scotland. So hmm. I, I, I say in the book that, that the Gales are the original flowers of Scotland. And the term Scot referred to somebody who was a Gallic speaker or who was linguistically, ethnically a Gale. And that term was used for both Scotland and Ireland throughout much of the medieval period. And then what happens, uh, you have this kind of switch over in, in the 15th century where people in the lowlands who are speaking a form of English, which they referred to as English, they take on the term to refer to themselves and then to alienate the Gales and call them heirs and tie them to Ireland. So you have this complete turnaround of the meaning of the term. And, and it, you know, it is very similar to the usage of other terms in other colonial contexts, such as American or Indian, right? So originally the Americans were the native peoples here. And then eventually the European colonists take that term over and call the people Indians, which is bizarre because we're not in India. You know, so this is, these are many examples of how words and languages and names for languages and identities change over time. That's a great example, the American example compared to the Scots example. But it also shows you how, you know, we like to draw these lines and say Highland, Lowland. Mm -hmm. And we often project these lines back into the past before they originated. You know, I mean, I've so many times I've heard people refer to England before the Romans. Well, there, there really wasn't an England before the Romans. So, I mean, I think this is a really fascinating part of, of what you're looking at in this book. Also the word Scot, that was something I learned uh, from this book, that it, it, it's cognate to the word Sco in modern, in modern Irish Gaelic. And I think it's Ska, Ska. Mm -hmm. in Scottish Gaelic. But uh, yeah, you can go to Galway and see signs in the windows of shops saying, Iesk Jan Sco, you know, the best of the fish, the best of fish, you know. Uh, and, and a fish store. So it's interesting that that word led to the word Scotty and then Scott as in Scotland. So fascinating. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the words in particular, Scott was one of the first, the first one you look at in the book. But there's some other ones too that, that show how long this interchange has been going on. And one of them that you mentioned, I think is really interesting is the word curse. Uh, which I think most people would think, well, that's got to be a very old English word, and it's been in English a long time. But can you explain a bit about how that word, you know, may have originated? Well, yeah, that's that's complicated, and I only understand kind of the, the general outline of it. Um, but it's a good it's a good illustration of the early mixings of people in the island of Britain. Um, and the way in which in the early phases of Christianity, they were very reliant upon Gallic scholars and clerics to set up the Christian church. Now, of course, the church itself, the apparatus of the church, the books in the church would have been mostly in Latin. So, you know, already you have a multilingual set of peoples and environments that are operating. And so they're, they're, they're using a lot of terminology from the church, which, which are in Latin, but they themselves would have been Gallic speakers. And the church based in Iona, the church founded by Columba, this was a very important and very sophisticated religious institution. And so they were instrumental in setting up the church in other places, especially in the area of Northumbria, so the, the north of, of England, what's now England. The church at Lindisfarne, for example, is one of the key uh, areas of the Christian activity in Britain. And Gales were dominant there for, for several generations of the running of the church, the, the uh, bishops and, and so on that were, that were in place uh, defining and establishing Christianity. So you have uh, what seems to be language contact between both Latin and Gallic coming up, uh, uh, resulting in this term curse which then gets borrowed into uh, England as spoken in the North, in, in Northumbria, and then it being spread through other um, Christian social networks, basically, to other areas of England. So again, it's a good, it's a good illustration of 
this multilingual, multi-ethnic environment, which has always existed really in, in England, sorry, in, in Britain, in the British Isles, Britain and Ireland, um, where you have multiple languages, multiple key people coming in contact. And, uh, and oftentimes, another point I make in the book, which has perhaps not been emphasized very much in the past, is that sometimes the pedigree for a word is not that simple. It's not just a single line of influence. Often there are multiple influences that end up creating a word that resembles one or more languages uh, in the minds of the people who hear it and then begin to use it. Right, and I, I, you believe, I believe curse is one of those words, isn't it? Because there's it a potential Latin derivation and the Gaelic derivation. And I think, I think shanty is another interesting one, which actually may not have come into English in Scotland or in Europe, but perhaps in North America. Could you explain a bit about that and, and how that uh, came about? Right, well, I, again, I, I only know kind of the, the broad outline. I don't know the details, but uh, it's, it was pointed out in the mid 20th century that this term shanty, which of course is very common in North American English, seems to again be a confluence of two different terms, both the Irish term shanty, 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 as we know in, in, in Gaelic, uh, and, uh, and a French term, which is also very similar, chantier, I think, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the pronunciation, um, meaning kind of a, a shack or, you know, a, an old ruinous house. And so, it's an example of a word with multiple parentage because you have resemblances between languages that enable people to borrow them with slightly different shades of meaning. Mm -hmm. So nothing is necessarily as clear as it might seem at first. Uh, what are some of the other words that, well, one question I had for you before asking about more specific words was the impact of literature, of written literature on the transmission of words between languages. I mean, obviously there's this, the transmission of words by mouth, uh, just people picking them up from other people's speech. Mm -hmm. But you know, at some point, some of these words became used in literature. Can you talk a bit more about that and what that reveals to us? Sure. Um, well, what's, what's interesting is, as you, as you say, I'll just kind of rephrase it, that a great number of these words came from Scottish Gaelic and were borrowed by their nearest neighbors, which are the Lowlanders who again spoke a Germanic language, which is a mixture of Middle English and Flemish and a few other influences. There's some, some, some Norse influence as well. And, you know, because they're living cheek by jowl, you have Gales moving to cities and Lowlanders doing business in the Highlands and so on. So you have several centuries of words being borrowed from Gaelic into Lowland Scots. And then uh, in the 18th century, of course, you get Highlanders beginning to emigrate in larger numbers, and then their influence is going further afield. And many of the borrowings from the late 19th and 20th centuries are directly from Gaelic into North American English. But in that period we, where you have words going into Lowland Scots, then, of course, we have a flowering of Lowland Scots literature or Lowland Scots authors that are popular in the Anglophone world in the late 18th century and early 19th century. And the two main examples of that being Robert Burns for poetry and Walter Scott for prose. And their works in particular kind of accelerate or amplify the effect of these Gallic borrowings. So you have words such as um, slogan, um, which are used in the writings of these popular authors that then get picked up in the wider Anglophone world just via literature, not because Anglophones you know, have neighbors that are Gaelic speaker, speakers or people in a neighboring community which are Gaelic speakers, but because they're reading them. And, um, and I think that that, that that medium of literacy, not only does it spread this further uh, afield, but there's a kind of empathetic connection you can make with literature which was much less tense, much less conflictual than the actual relationships that Gales had with Anglophones as living people, as living communities. Okay. Well, if you're to look at some of those words now that you've explored in this book, what are some of the top ones that, that stand out to you? Well, there's a number of very interesting ones. Um, speaking to an Anglophone community in the States, 
or North America, I should say in general. One of those that, that I think is pretty interesting um, that I did some uh, somewhat unique exploration on is the word shindig. There was a little illustration here. And I want to mention that, that the book has 30 illustrations done by an illustrator who lives in North Carolina because I wanted to make a book that was very fun and accessible and kind of tongue in cheek. Uh, and so illustrations are a really good way to help bring that alive and, and add some humor. Um, so shindig, of course, is a very common word that people will be familiar with in North America. There is a very big uh, event, cultural event in Asheville called the shindig. It's also the title of an animated film starring Mickey Mouse in 1930. So, so people are pretty familiar with the word shindig. And there's also a related word, which is shindy, which kind of has the same basic associations. And it appears, you know, again, like shindig in the early 19th, well, mid 19th century, a lot of uncertainty about where this comes from. Uh, but clearly I think it's, it's related to the word sheen jack in Gaelic, which sheen jack, of course, that's very close to shindig and shindy is not too far off as well. And uh, the word shinty in Lowland Scots, which, which again, there's kind of a um, confluence between sh shinty and sheen jack in Gaelic. Um, so we have kind of a nexus of words that means, you know, leaping and hopping and skipping and jumping and creating a big commotion, which is of course, not only indicative of the game of Shinty, but also there would be a big, now Shinty was held generally, especially in the Highlands, but in the Longs as well, as part of villages coming together during festivities, right? When they didn't have to do agricultural work and other things like right. that. And so you'd have a huge number of people getting together, having fun, probably drinking, and then partying afterwards. And so this association of meetings and, and terminology you get, you know, in Scotland, but also in North America, where you see the, the word first appearing for parties, people are getting together for parties. And sometimes these become very rowdy. Did that appear in one part of North America or several parts where there were, you know, perhaps Scottish immigrants present? Well, this, this appears in a number of different places, um, just in, in travel writing or uh, sometimes in fiction. Uh, in the about the 1840s, I think is when it starts to, to appear. So people are using it as a descriptive term as something that's already kind of in vernacular usage, but is, you know, it's already done some traveling and kind of infiltrated a bit. So it's kind of hard to pin down to a particular place or even time. Um, yeah, I've kind of lost my place here, but here we go. 1840s, um, let's see, in, in Florida was one of the first places. So, you know, there are little Gaelic speaking communities all over the place, but exactly where this would have come from is not exactly clear. As many things are not when we go into etymology, right? Yeah, yeah. But fascinating, it's a fascinating connection. Uh, any other word that, that really you'd like to share with us a bit more about today and uh, give us some more detail on? Well, there are really a lot of very interesting stories and, and unusual connections. Um, I'll give you one other one, which is the word snazzy. So the word snazzy, again, this is one of these words where there's an undefinite uh, etymology or derivation of it. It became common in American English, which is where it really first starts in the 1930s on the West Coast. And of course, in the West Coast, just like many parts of North America, you have all kinds of different cultures and languages coming together. So, you know, where do you trace it? Now, one common story about its origin is that there was a performer who's, who went by this stage name of Mr. Snazzle. And he was sometimes referred to as Snazzy. And he performed, uh, he performed in New Zealand and Australia and in various places in the Anglophone world. And one story is that it comes from his name, but he died in, let's see, what was it, 1912. So he died in 1912 and it doesn't really start appearing as an adjective to the 1930s. So that's not a very credible idea or etymology for the name. 
And instead of that, uh, and I'm, I'm picking up here on uh, one of my instructors at university, Ronnie Black, who this is one of the things that he's done in like in his teaching resources for teaching Gaelic. And he mentions in some places, you know, various words in English that seem to come from Gaelic and, and snasta or snazzy is one of them that he pointed out. So, you know, I can't take credit for the background research for a lot of these. I'm mostly drawing on the work of real etymologists, but I'm bringing together Gallic texts and English texts to kind of demonstrate the affinities between the words. So, uh, so going back to California, um, and I've done a lot of work in the last just like six months really about Gallic on, uh, in San Francisco on the West Coast generally, which is the area where snazzy first appears in Anglophone writings. And there were, you know, a good number of gales actually in the area. You have Highland Games from the, um, from the 1860s happening on the West Coast and a, a very active Gallic learning community in San Francisco during that time period. There were over a hundred people learning Gallic under the direction of, let's see, what was his name? Seamus Machgadi. Um, uh, James Hay, James McDonald Hay. And uh, he, was, he was a very strident nationalist who you know, had this vision of a Gaelic speaking Scotland. And um, so he was just one of a number of people who were Gaelic speakers there who were kind of, you know, strutting their Gaelicness in terms of, you know, what they wore and speaking Gaelic and so on. And my guess is that it's from that connection that the term snasal goes from Gaelic into English as snazzy. And this is the, uh, this is the illustration from snazzy in the book. It's kind of cute. <laughs> well, fantastic. And the illustrator was the same illustrator who uh, worked with you, no? No, it's a different one. Different one, yeah. okay. And I'll just mention really quickly that, that we are working on transforming the illustrations into viable items like shirts and coffee mugs and other sorts of apparel so that you can you can show your affinity to the language and to the borrowings into English for things like you know names of birds and activities like you know motorcycling and horse riding and pet keeping and all these sorts of things. Gleva. Well it's been a delight to talk to you about this. This sounds like a book that will really give people uh, a better understanding and appreciation of Gaelic, of Scottish Gaelic and its connections to English as well as its own value. Uh, you know, certainly will give them some, some things to think about in terms of the origins of words we use every day or on occasions such as snazzy and shindig. And I hope to see you at a shindig in the near future. Oh, but, I can't uh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you tell us how we can get this book? Well, uh, it can be ordered through any bookshop. Uh, it has an ISBN number. I, I always uh, suggest that people use their bookshop first before resorting to uh, on online uh, monopolies, who I won't name. But it can be ordered in many different ways. Fantastic. Well, Michal, kapaglet gumor, and uh, we hope to see you back again soon, and uh, wish you the best of luck with this book. And all your work. Uh, before you go, actually, could you tell us a bit about uh, the Hidden Glen School? Sure. Um, you know, it is really heartening, I think, to see that there are so many people involved in learning the language, Gaelic, and this is keeping, you know, the people who are, who are Gaelic teachers busy, I think, I hope. Um, but what I did recognize just over a year ago was that there is really a need to take people deeper into the culture itself and to figure out well, okay, the language is there, but how does it connect to culture and into belief and the cosmology and to human ecology, all these things that I think people are interested in because people recognize that we, we are down, going down a very dangerous path in the world and we need to think about alternative ways of being, but dressing the injustices of the past to thinking about how do we reconfigure communities and our relationship to land to create a sustainable world. And so a lot of people are coming to Gallic with those kinds of questions and they're, and they're not getting much guidance from universities who don't teach this stuff. So I created Hidden Glen in late 2019 in order to teach classes to give people this kind of information. So um, I, uh, I am 
currently working full time. So I'm just teaching now and again, uh, teaching a course. But um, I am, if you go to hiddenglen.org, I've got a blog there where I blog occasionally about how these issues intersect with the Scottish Gaelic world. And, and I announced I'm going to be teaching courses. Uh, in late March, I'll be teaching the Reclaiming the Roots course. And it's one of four courses that I teach about Gaelic subjects. Well, fantastic. So you mentioned hiddenglen.org. People can also find you on Facebook and uh, on Patreon too, I believe. Yeah, uh, P Patreon, I have a website there and I've got, uh, I have, I think close to a hundred articles there, some of which are restricted to patrons and others are open to the public. Okay. Well, Rish, Morantank, Agus Bianaglai. Tapa Dave